gentlemen, uh, I am uh, delighted to uh, welcome you to this uh, talk uh, by uh, Mr. Sarko Chamsuddin, uh, who is, please, hold on, who is, uh, uh, I guess this is set up for me to sit here, so I will, uh, who is uh, 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 a member of the uh, Iraqi federal parliament, um, um, which is unfortunately the, it's a unicameral, not theoretically unicameral, but actually unicameral uh, body, and unfortunately the translation that has stuck is the Council of Representatives. A better translation from the Arabic would have been the Chamber of Deputies, um, which has a constitutional precedence in Iraq, but I digress. He is the Deputy Chair of the Iraq-US Friendship Committee and a ranking member uh, of the Civil Society Committee. Uh, he is a co-founder uh, of the uh, New Generation Movement, which, uh, which is a new political party run on a national platform uh, promoting women's rights, economic prosperity, and a strong partnership between the Kurdistan region of Iraq and Baghdad. Now, this is a very interesting development in the politics of the Kurdistan region of Iraq as you have, a, 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 you have two dominant parties and now a, um, a nascent party, which has seats, obviously, in, in the federal parliament, um, that is advocating for a national platform uh, for if, uh, and I, I'm trying to choose my words carefully, for a pan-Iraqi platform that also include, that includes the realization of the constitutional protections and rights which are in the Iraqi constitution as, as those parts of the constitution pertain to the Kurdistan region of Iraq. So it's a very interesting uh, new, uh, uh, um, new uh, development, uh, particularly in light of what's happening on the streets of uh, Iraq cities in Baghdad and South. Uh, in 2018, Mr. Shamsuddin was the top candidate for this uh, new generation um, uh, movement in his hometown of Suleymaniya, uh, where it happens my maternal grandfather was born, uh, and, uh, uh, and won a popular vote, as I said, to become uh, a member of the Iraqi federal parliament, uh, and indeed he is the youngest member of the Iraqi parliament. Um, Prior to uh, his work uh, uh, in uh, the Kurdistan region of Iraq and now in Baghdad, uh, he worked with the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad and with the U.S. Consulate in Erbil in various capacities. He also worked as a journalist for three years covering the Obama administration. Um, and um, it turns out there's one other commonality sort of between us, uh, and that is that uh, uh, Mr. Shamsuddin has a master's degree from the Virginia Polytechnic University now, I think it is, uh, where my father taught briefly uh, in the uh, early 1970s. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Mr. Sarkot Shamsuddin. Thank you, Dr. Faisal, and uh, I'm really glad to be here uh, among you today to discuss uh, some of the interesting um, uh, events or developments happening in Iraq and in, the, in Iraq because it's uh, maybe the only country uh, in the Middle East that the uh, United States uh, has different relations with. Uh, in other Middle Eastern countries, uh, maybe you have uh, some economic interest and some uh, um, security interest, but in Iraq you have uh, your sons and daughters fought shoulder to shoulder with uh, our sons and daughters against a common enemy, not, not against each other. So maybe that's the only uh, Middle Eastern country, Muslim Middle Eastern country, uh, that Americans and uh, Iraqis, they fought together to rebuild the country. Uh, I uh, hope this is going to be an opportunity to uh, understand or learn more about the other side of the developments happening in Iraq. You hear a lot of bad news in, uh, from your uh, 
the breaking news about Iraq. Iraq is falling apart. Iraq is bloody and uh, uh, people are killing each other. So all of the bad news you hear maybe today, uh, you would be a little bit surprised that I'm not going to talk about that because that's really not true. That's not what's happening in Iraq. And sometimes, uh, despite of the uh, different opinions that you may have, and other people they may have, that uh, uh, 2003 was a blunder, uh, but to some extent, uh, it is, it's not maybe economically, it was uh, 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 destructive to US uh, uh, economy, uh, but the result is now uh, more promising, and I think we see that's uh, surviving. The Iraqi uh, democratic process is surviving after like 17 years. Uh, this march will be uh, 17 years after the uh, overthrow of the uh, former regime. So I will try to uh, briefly go through this, maybe reading it, just and also uh, open to any questions, even if I didn't mention anything here. So um, uh, in Kurdistan, I'm an opposition voice, a critical voice of the Kurdistan regional government. In Baghdad as well, a critical. So uh, I don't have a <coughs> government responsibility. I, it's fine to disturb White House or anybody else. So uh, feel free to ask questions uh, about the policies of uh, your country in, in Iraq and also versus Iran in Iraq. Uh, so I'm open to all of the uh, questions. Uh, just I will try to briefly uh, what I uh, thought would be interesting uh, to give you a brief uh, introduction of the uh, developments in Iraq and how we got here. So despite the tragic stories and the breaking news you frequently consume about Iraq, we can take a measure of heart in its success. Indeed, this is the story of 17 years since the U.S.-led coalition overthrew the former regime of Saddam Hussein. One cannot help but be affected both by the tragedies that taken place or by the hope that the springs from the power and the potential of Iraq's people. Despite all of these problems, Iraq's democratic institutions continue to function. And this institution is among the most democratic in the Middle East, along with Israel and Tunisia. Prime ministers and presidents come and go peacefully. And this parliament reflects the diversity of our society. All major components and minorities are represented. Women make over 20% of the, our parliament, and youth participation in politics and decision making has increased election after election. That's in this one, we are in women participation and youth, we are doing better than the US Congress. Uh, compared with our neighbors, Iraq has uh, already a diversity of media outlets that are able to openly oppose the government. It is true that journalists uh, come under pressure from uh, the political parties, the militias, and there is uh, much work need to be done to improve the state of press freedom in Iraq and Kurdistan region. But in general, there are hundreds of privately owned uh, media outlets and thousands of social media channels that are not censored by the state. They tried to do that, but uh, it was great that two times in the parliament there was a bill, I blocked it. And I will, and uh, as long as I stay, I will not allow it. This, this is part of my committee, so we blocked the bill to regulate Facebook. Uh, if you look around the Middle East, Iraq is surrounded by autocratic states where everything is censored, including media and freedom of information. Currently, there are no journalists in jail in Iraq for political crimes, like in Turkey, uh, which is one of the world's greatest jailers of journalists or Iran. In all of this, we do not see uh, perfection, but progress. Uh, for security and stability, so in 2003, U.S. overthrew the regime and dissolved the entire state institutions, critically including the security institutions, the military, the police, and the intelligence service. Starting from the scratch has both good and bad qualities. It was good because we had the better opportunity to shape institutions that reflected the new era where all components of Iraq actively could actively participate in decision making for the first time. Moreover, it ended the brutal isolation of Iraq and enabled a positive and future-oriented relationship with the US and other Western countries and also other countries in the Middle East. It was bad because starting from the scratch was very expensive. Institutions take decades to take shape and progress can be fragile. 
this is a lesson that the U.S. has learned in its efforts to maintain security and stability and aid uh, our transition into democracy. Our NAS institutions have been exploited by Iran and other neighboring countries for their own strategic uh, purposes. Radical groups have found safe haven in Iraq as well, not because Iraqis were interested in these groups or in inter uh, Iranian interventions or Saudi's interventions, but because we had uh, an inadequate security infrastructure to defend the populations against these predator groups. But in many ways, the most disappointing and tragic trade of the post-2003 era is that Iraq's own leadership has, oppor uh, has opportunistically exploited these weaknesses to strengthen their own position, uh, pillage the country's wealth, and wage proxy wars on behalf of other countries and militia interests. The current situation and demonstrations. So you hear in the news that there are demonstrations for over three months since uh, October last year, and people are peaceful, uh, young Iraqis, women and men, are on street, especially in Baghdad and south of Iraq. So Iraq somehow, uh, ethnically somehow mixed, and also uh, there are cities and areas that are predominated by one sect. So the south, and uh, uh, which is the majority of the country, and uh, the, the Baghdad, was the the main face of the of the demonstration not because only uh, crisis and corruptions uh, by the way this demonstration is against the government against our own governments against us uh, the council of representatives because we didn't do enough and they are right we didn't do enough for them and we failed them uh, so they are asking for radical reforms but the, by, by far this is a national uh, demand it's not only related to that part of the country it's not only the one sect that's really uh, been blamed or responsible for what's happening in Iraq, but it is the, the, the opportunity that they might be in a better position to uh, uh, have the, this demonstration not to be accused of uh, uh, anti-Iraq uh, or uh, maybe a proxies of US or somebody else. So, uh, the, but also people in, in Soleimania, in Erbil, uh, symbolically, they join them on social media, they support them. So it is, it's a demonstration actually for the real reforms in the country. It's not sectarian demonstration, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very promising. Uh, all, of the, uh, all, of, all of this brings us to the current situation in Iraq, which also contains both immense tragedy and seeds of hope. Young people are dying on the streets fighting for their rights. The current wave of demonstrations are a sign of public engagement and rejection of disillusionment. It is a movement to bring about change and force the elite to adopt radical reforms. <coughs> the current situation is not titling into a sectarian war or an insurgency, which you are so used to, to hearing from about Iraq. Instead, the protest promised change brought about the, the principles enshrined in the First Amendment of, uh, our constitution, of your constitution, peaceful uh, assembly and petitioning the government for a redress of grievances by their determination and sacrifices. The demonstrators have pushed an incumbent prime minister to resign. That never happened in Iraq peacefully, never any prime minister resigned peacefully. A feat that was uh, impossible under the former regime or former regimes. The demonstrators have forced the parliament to adopt a new electoral system and a new electoral board that seeks to uh, circumvent the sectarian division. They have forced Parliament to adopt other reforms, including in the financial sector. More than 500 of my compatriots have died and thousands more wounded in the crackdown by the government and militias to accomplish this, and we honor their sacrifice. But we, we also see in the protest is that sectarian sentiment is very unpopular and not a major concern for average Iraqis. The major demands of the people and the demonstrators are economic reforms, jobs, better services, and social justice. Baghdad, Najaf, Diwaniya, Nasiriyah, and many other cities have become the place where people hold anti-government demonstrations on a daily basis, exercising their right to hold the ruling elites accountable. Today, a, a new cabinet, there was an attempt to new cabinet to be confirmed, because the former one was resigned, but that was delayed for uh, next week. So, 
why I mentioned this when the, there was a discussion uh, with uh, Ambassador Isra Abadi and uh, Carol about the title for this event to be uh, an American story. Iraq, you know, the, the, the entire institutions were rebuilt in coordination with Iraqi leaders, Iraqi politicians, but also it was mostly led by the U.S. and it was uh, the creation of the U.S. And some of the institutions are duplicate of the U.S. institutions here, so the U.S. tried to have the lower house and the upper house. So far, the upper house is not there because that need to be regulated by law. But also, the justice, uh, the Supreme Court is also, you have nine justices, we have nine justices, so uh, somehow they are pa as powerful as, as, as yours. Uh, but also, it is the only country that U.S., other than money and security, uh, you do more than that. Like you do, you build the institutions and you try to bring uh, to uh, uh, bring a new democratic system, which is has a lot of flaws and issues. But that's so far in the Middle East is the only uh, uh, one that is resilient and stayed for uh, over 17 years and so far peaceful. We went through the uh, civil war. We went through the sectarian war, the insurgencies and the Baghdad were about to be fallen into the hand of the insurgent groups, but we were able, with the help of Americans and others, to defend ourselves and to now to talk about normal things, healthcare and, uh, and job creations, banking sector, and it's normal parliamentary uh, discussions, uh, except sometimes we are distracted by Washington, and I'm happy to talk about that. Iraq is the only Muslim country in the, in the Middle East where Americans and Iraqis have fought together against common enemies, not against each other. It is where uh, over 4,000 of your loved ones made ultimate sacrifice shoulder to shoulder with the Iraqis in the fight against terrorism, which we uh, highly appreciate. In the few other places in the region, do Americans have such close bond with people? based on shared experience in many other Middle Eastern countries, you have only economic and security interest. And in Iraq, you have these two as well. But in Iraq, we have also fought together to build something new. This new beginning is struggling to stand on its feet. It needs your political and diplomatic support. The protesters in Baghdad and Tahrir Square are a part of our shared legacy, our shared future. And we call them as our uh, civil rights movement. Like many other uh, developing countries, we face uh, numerous challenges, unemployment, corruption, improving services and reform uh, critical elements like the banking, financial security sector, uh, ensuring a fair electoral system and achieving better governance. We need to build a strong institution to protect our citizens and operate according to the rule of law. We need to work harder to dissolve militias because no democratic process can survive under militia dominations, whether it's Kurdish militia or it's, uh, it's Arab militias. It's, they are militias and they will, they will serve the interest of uh, a group of people, not the, uh, the, the state. And they're not in interested in state. The new government should hold those accountable who are accused of killing peaceful demonstrators and putting pressure on journalists. Uh, uh, on journalists. We can do all of this but we need support from our friends, especially the United States, not distraction and also uh, not uh, uh, seeing Iraq from the lenses of uh, policies of a different country. That's a, that's a major issue uh, we have with the United States and uh, our relations with the U.S. were almost, almost collapsed when uh, the Iraqi and Iranian generals in Iraq were targeted. Uh, the strikes conducted in Iraq without cooperation with the Iraqi government. And we almost lost uh, the parliament sessions and we could not uh, continue uh, working on the, some of the reform packages we had. So um, I, I was in Washington in the last uh, couple weeks and my message was just to see Iraq as Iraq, not. Uh, uh, your differences with Iran. I know Iran is powerful and is strong in Iraq. They have uh, cultural and uh, religious and historical ties with Iraqis, with all components of Iraq, especially with the South. And that's undeniable, and we cannot deny that. Uh, but that should not be the uh, uh, justification for Iranians to come tell us what should we do or uh, how should we deal with the United States or other countries. 
And I think uh, uh, we had a better opportunity with previous administrations where trying to strengthen Iraqi institutions to be able uh, to do this fight by themselves, to uh, prevent the intervention of Iranians and also uh, nowadays, the Gulf countries, uh, they are more cooperating with the Iraqi government, they are more respectful of the Iraqi government, including Turkey as well. Uh, but it's, it's only Iran and U.S. seems to see no Iraq, only see themselves in Iraq. Like Iran is, uh, they don't have any problem with Iraq, they have problem with the U.S. in Iraq. And U.S. is the same. They don't have any problem with Iraq, they have problems with Iran in Iraq. So. It is the, it's a complicated situation now we have, and it is going to be very um, uh, negative. It will impact the movement on street, and we have a lot of hope for this movement on street to achieve. They achieved uh, already a lot compared to uh, other efforts uh, or other uh, uh, pressure from the civil society. This time, they forced the Iraqi parliament uh, to do things which uh, otherwise would not do it even uh, maybe in four, in, in, we did what we achieved in three months, I think we would not be able to do it in four years uh, just because of the pressure from the, the street. And that's, that's a positive thing happened in Iraq, but the, the distraction from Tehran and Washington is uh, very destructive. And that's uh, uh, the, the brief introduction I hope that was uh, clear enough and uh, brief enough to, to consume uh, uh, easily. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I don't normally do this, but we have some time, so I'm going to take the prerogative of convening this, uh, this uh, uh, gathering uh, uh, to uh, maybe ask a couple of questions, and then we'll open it up to everybody else. Um, uh, we're, we're honored that you, uh, that you came uh, to Indiana, and to my knowledge at least, this is your only, don't contradict me if I'm wrong, you can tell me later, but uh, <laughs> to my knowledge, it's your only speaking engagement outside of Washington. We're delighted to have you here. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting to me that my political mentor was uh, uh, one of at most two statesmen uh, in Iraq, at most two. Uh, in the post-1958 period, that is to say the period after uh, the overthrow of the Iraqi monarchy in 1958, uh, Dr. Adnan Patrici, uh, who in his last, uh, he died on the uh, 17th of November 2019 at the age of 96, in his last interview uh, said that the political class in Iraq had been a failure. Uh, and he, to be fair to him, said the political class in Iraq, and I'm quoting now, the political uh, class in Iraq, and I am one of them, referring to himself, has been a failure and has established that it is incapable of governing in Iraq. And he actually called on the young, now this would have been three years before he died, but he actually called on the young to take to the streets, to demand a new political, to, a reordering of the settlement, the post-2003 settlement, which did not rely on sectarianism, but on the identity of the citizen as a citizen of the state, uh, and to come out against corruption. So uh, when he died, uh, three years after he had said all this, uh, he had rather a rough time of it the last three years of his life. Uh, I wrote in the condolence book, which was opened by the embassy in Washington that the demonstrators on the streets of, this was last November, the demonstrators on the streets of Iraq don't know it, but they're demonstrating for Dr. Patrici's vision of Iraq. Whether that's true um, or not, um, what they're demanding is a, a new dispensation uh, in which positions in government, whether at the very top or at the very bottom of government, are distributed based on ability and not on sectarian or ethnic affiliation and not on partisan affiliation. They want an, an accounting for the corruption in Iraq over the last 17 years um, and, and fundamentally a reordering of the political structure. So my question to you, and I'm sorry that was a very long uh, introduction, but my 
question to you is, have we wasted the last five months, more or less, four months since the, well, to be fair, three months, since the current prime minister, the outgoing prime minister resigned? Have we wasted the last three months trying to form a new government? And it's not clear at all that the prime minister designate will succeed in forming a new government. But have we wasted the last three months trying to form a government rather than going to elections immediately, since that is the principal demand of the demonstrators. Um, it's a reasonable demand, given the inability of successive governments to address the problems of the country. Should we have taken this much time to try to form a new government? Should we have gone to elections immediately? Uh, uh, thank you for the uh, mention of Dr. Pachichi and uh, uh, in, indeed, they are the people on the street that uh, are doing uh, what he asked for, and hopefully they will be uh, successful, and we are being, we're going to be their partners. And that's true. This is my first time outside of, uh, of Washington, the Beltway. Uh, uh, they call speech. it flyover country yes. over there. <laughs> and also the first time to be in, in Midwest uh, when we came here with my wife, uh, Shania. And we didn't. Ha we had no idea what is it's going to look like Midwest. We heard a lot about you, but we had never been here. Uh, but the food was amazing. So we had lunch here, and and we didn't know it's just cold that cold. So uh, that was also uh, c c when I talked to uh, Dr. Faisal, he told me that it looks like Washington, like. Uh, but Washington was somehow cooler. Uh, it was, uh, you didn't need a big jacket uh, these days. It's, uh, but when you arrived here, the, the plane said, oh, wow, it's, it's snowing here. So it's a uh, little bit different. Uh, and I'm happy to continue to do that and to have more people interested in the Middle East, uh, but also mostly interested in, in Iraq, because like I mentioned, it is you have different bonds with different countries in the Middle East, but you uh, have uh, completely, uh, we share a lot of stories. I go to Arlington Cemetery sometimes and I see a lot of soldiers where like they lost their lives in, in, in Iraq and I see that they didn't do it only for Americans, they did it also for Iraqis. Maybe some Iraqis, they don't appreciate it, but uh, I think that's something uh, those who, who uh, went through the former regime's uh, uh, brutality, so we appreciate that. Uh, uh, to answer your question, and I believe so, it's, it's a, I have the same uh, belief that we should have just gone for the uh, early elections uh, in Iraq, uh, but th there are some technical and legal issues for uh, early elections. First of all, the demonstrators, they, they do not want to uh, hold the election under the same law. They want to have a new electoral system, and the new electoral system uh, took so many t uh, weeks and months until to bring the uh, pressure uh, by the demonstrators all sides to agree on uh, a single bill and which is still there are some components of the bill not being passed the the, the big part of it it's passed uh, so we, we changed from big provinces like uh, the Iraqi political system was divided based on provinces provinces are, are like somehow like states here uh, so now, according to the new electoral system, which was the demanded by the protesters to do it even like a smaller districts, like 100,000 uh, uh, people in a neighborhood or a city will be given uh, an, an, like a seat. So they will have their representative. They, will ha they know who is their, 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 their representative and they will uh, uh, be in touch with him or her uh, when he or she's elected. <coughs> So that was a, a complicated process. But also this coming, this parliament that I'm, I'm part of, it's very dysfunctional. It, is, it came in a very uh, difficult time. It was after the fight against ISIS. We have uh, over 70 to 80 MPs that are directly affiliated with militia leaders. Some of them, they were themselves militias. They were fought against ISIS, that's true. We appreciate that their sacrifice, uh, but they have no idea how to work on in the parliament. They are not interested in discussing bills. They are not expert in only any of these fields, uh, and th that takes a long, a lot of time to convince them to do something meaningful. Uh, not only in the electoral system, in other uh, reform sector, that's very difficult to to deal with them. 
and we have dozens of them uh, where uh, previously we were arrested by Americans, we were tortured, uh, arrested, detained uh, uh, when in the U.S. was there. So we have a very de tense situation inside Parliament, and sometimes we have a distraction from Iran or from Washington. So that's also affecting the process in the Parliament. And so we were able to finally to pass the, the big bill, the, which was the major demand by demonstrators, and we dissolved the uh, former electoral uh, board, which was partisan, sectarian, and uh, exploited by uh, big parties. And uh, they succeeded in, in making us to, to do that. And the majority of the parliament, they didn't want to do that. They want to stay. Uh, so that was the first step. The, th the second step is if you want to do early elections, uh, first you need to have the board of election to be ready, uh, completely ready, because the United Nations uh, office in Iraq, in Baghdad, they told us uh, if you want to do uh, an election, it's not going to be just for the sake of doing it. The IHAC, uh, which is the electoral uh, board, uh, need to be ready and they need to be trained. They, it's a new system. Uh, they are judges, they are not experts of elections, so it will, logistically, it will take some time to, uh, the, the, this, is the system, the, this is how it's, it's, it's going to work. So the uh, IHAC should tell the Prime Minister that they are ready to do elections in six months, for example, at least it's six months, that's their, their uh, deadline. Uh, the, the less than six months, for them, logistically, they cannot do it. And also, if early election in the Iraqi uh, constitution is only done in one way, uh, it's when the parliament is dissolved. And I don't think the majority of MPs, they, they want to dissolve it. They don't want to fire themselves. They have to vote to fire themselves, so to dissolve themselves, to allow the election to go on. Uh, uh, on. So that's why they make it, they, they delay it, they do other things, they uh, try to uh, make some other uh, tough decisions, uh, financial decisions, for example, uh, you know, having allowances for graduates, unemployment benefits, uh, and also releasing the loans for housing for other projects. That was like bureaucratic uh, steps were taken in the government institutions, uh, all uh, really uh, uh, removed for the sake of convincing the street, which has not been successful, because it's too late. So it is the, it's still it's the demand to do early elections, and this is one of the, uh, one of the uh, promises of the new uh, PM designee, uh, who said he will ask for early election or hold early election in one year, which is between now and, and next year, March. Uh, the election is due in March uh, or April 2022. Uh, so we still have two more years, uh, but the protesters are pushing the, 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 the politicians, the uh, Iraqi parliament, to do it earlier. So that there are some logistic issues, but also there are some uh, legal barriers, so constitutional barriers, which is make it very hard for the current MPs. I think most of them uh, will not, I mean, 90% of them will not really uh, see parliament again if we will have early elections, because most of them were blamed for uh, the current crisis, uh, and also they came under massive fraud in the last elections. And also, 60% of the people, they didn't participate in the vote. That's why we have angry people on the street. They didn't believe in any of us, in, not only in Baghdad, that's in Kurdish region as well. Like 60, the real number was 60%, they didn't uh, want to, to the ballot, they didn't participate. And it was a political uh, decision. It was not just they didn't like it, they were not interested, uh, they didn't see any, any uh, benefit, personal benefit for them. No, it was really a direct political decision by the people like, we do not want you, you are destroyed, you failed us. And that's true. I mean, uh, it, it, even I, I, I said that publicly on, on Twitter, if, if it cost my seat, I will vote for dissolvement of the parliament because 600 uh, people, uh, peaceful demonstrators, uh, uh, the journalists were killed by these militias because government is weak. Prime Minister was weak to take uh, to stop them, and uh, there are more blood uh, every day. Uh, people are killed and kidnapped and tortured by these militias, and they are gaining more power as state become weaker and weaker. 
so that's uh, it's, it's a very dangerous uh, development if we are not really taking some serious steps uh, to even if it's not early election maybe in six months at least in next year to do something about that and if the prime minister which is the deadline is on Monday if he fails to uh, form the cabinet I think the the, the, uh, the uh, early election will be the only way forward. well thank you very much uh, I should point out for those who follow Iraq there are a lot of commentators who are under the misimpression because they can't they don't understand the significance of commas in legal drafting um, are under the misimpression that the Iraqi president can dissolve parliament he cannot it is not within his uh, discretion uh, the parliament can only be dissolved by a simple majority of parliament itself it's one of the deep flaws exactly. in, the, in the Iraqi constitution, which is to say the same parties that have caused the impasse have to be the ones willing to vote themselves out of office right. to get past the impasse. It's a, it's, a, it's a deep flaw in the Iraqi constitution. I should like to say, because I do wear the flag of the monarchy in my lapel, that uh, in fact, the, in fact uh, the, uh, uh, there is a precedent for demonstrators forcing a government in Iraq to resign, and that's in 1948. Uh, the uh, Portsmouth Agreement demonstrations in which there were also um, demonstrators killed uh, by security forces caused the uh, government of uh, Saleh Jabr to resign, um, the first Shia Prime Minister of Iraq, uh, and Nouri Saeed, the longtime strongman of Iraq, was foreign minister. He also had to resign. Uh, Sayyid Mohammed al-Sadr was the president of the Senate. He was so outraged that uh, there were demon peaceful demonstrators killed. He resigned his seat in the Senate, and the Prince Regent called upon him to form a government and get us into elections. So it has happened before, um, but it's been a long time ago. Uh, let me open it up for, uh, for questions. Uh, Mr. Shaban, you, you have your hand up, I think. Yeah, uh, I, I thank you for coming. Thank you. And I see the background you came from and what you are trying to do. And the title of democracy in Iraq should be changed to chaos in Iraq. Because democracy actually, is for chaos. Because actually we haven't had democracy. We haven't had democracy since 48, uh, 58, when the change from monarchy and so on. And then I, I didn't plant that question, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't talked about this. Well, you want information. I was in that demonstration. And I, I know that, before. as a matter of fact. So you, but, you've, you've come around to my way of thinking. <laughs> No, that's a real thing. So we look at the corruption going on. Right. And in the parliament doesn't want to move because all of them benef beneficiaries. Uh, make billions of Iraqi wealth is a scatter. Right. And, and the country is totally corrupt. Much worse than what used during the royal regime, that's which true. was poor. And, and so what is the solution? Uh, if the parliament doesn't change, how, how long? You have already over 300 killed and 1,500 you know, wounded. No, no, no. It's something like six, 700 killed well, and 22,000 wounded. Yes. Those are the official numbers. Right. Sorry, go ahead. You have yes. the question. What's the solution? Uh, well, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult to uh, give a solution just uh, right away. Uh, I, I may have a solution, but it is not practical. Um, so send all the elite after 2003 to prison, so, but that's not going to work. Uh, so, uh, uh, that's true. Iraq is uh, struggling from uh, corruption, massive corruption. It's the biggest, cor biggest threat to Iraq is corruption now. Uh, and also after the corruption is the regional conflict between U.S. and Iraq. Uh, that's really also, if you live in Iraq, you know how uh, hard it is to leave uh, one day maybe the president of the United States will have a tweet to sanction Iraq for uh, being friendly with Iran and that's uh, uh, but because I mentioned that because the institutions are very weak and they have been there only 17 years uh, and US left uh, at least military long, a lot of time to convince them to do something meaningful uh, not only in the electoral system, in other uh, reform sector, that's very difficult to, to deal with them. And we have dozens of them uh, where uh, previously were arrested by Americans, were tortured, uh, arrested, detained, 
uh, when the U.S. was there. So we have a very de tense situation inside parliament, and sometimes we have a distraction from Iran or from Washington. So that's also affecting the process in the parliament. And so we were able to finally to pass the, the big bill, which was the major demand by the demonstrators, and we dissolved the uh, former electoral uh, board, which was partisan, sectarian, and uh, exploited by uh, big parties. And uh, they succeeded in, in making us to, to do that. And the majority of the parliament, they didn't want to do that. They want to stay. Uh, so that was the first step. The, th the second step is if you want to do early elections, uh, first you need to have the board of election to be ready, uh, completely ready, because the United Nations uh, office in Iraq, in Baghdad, they told us uh, if you want to do uh, an election, it's not going to be just for the sake of doing it. The IHAC, uh, which is the electoral uh, board, uh, need to be ready and they need to be trained. They, it's a new system. Uh, they are judges, they are not experts of elections, so it will, it, logistically, it will take some time to, uh, the, the, this, is the system, the, this is how it's, it's, it's going to work. So the uh, IHAC should tell the Prime Minister that they are ready to do elections in six months, for example, at least it's six months, that's their, their uh, deadline. Uh, the, the less than six months, for them, logistically, they cannot do it. And also, if early election in the Iraqi uh, constitution is only done in one way, uh, it's when the parliament is dissolved. And I don't think the majority of MPs, they, they want to dissolve it. They don't want to fire themselves. They have to vote to fire themselves, so to dissolve themselves, to allow the election to go on. Uh, uh, on. So that's why they make it, they, they delay it, they do other things, they uh, try to uh, make some other uh, tough decisions, uh, financial decisions, for example, uh, you know, having allowances for graduates, unemployment benefits, uh, and also releasing the loans for housing, for other projects. That was like bureaucratic uh, steps were taken in the government institutions, uh, all uh, really uh, uh, removed for the sake of convincing the street, which has not been successful, because it's too late. So it is the, it's still it's the demand to do early elections, and it is one of the, uh, one of the uh, promises of the new uh, PM designee, uh, who said he will ask for early election or hold early election in one year, which is between now and, and next year, March. Uh, the election is due in March uh, or April 2022. Uh, so we still have two more years, uh, but the protesters are pushing the, 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 the politicians, the uh, Iraqi parliament, to do it earlier. So that there are some logistic issues, but also there are some uh, legal barriers, so constitutional barriers, which is make it very hard for the current MPs. I think most of them uh, will not, I mean, 90% of them will not really uh, see parliament again if we will have early elections, because most of them were blamed for uh, the current crisis, uh, and also they came under massive fraud in the last elections. And also, 60% of the people, they didn't participate in the vote. That's why we have angry people on the street. They didn't believe in any of us, in, not only in Baghdad, that's in Kurdish region as well. Like 60, the real number was 60%, they didn't uh, want to, to the ballot, they didn't participate. And it was a political uh, decision. It was not just they didn't like it, they were not interested, uh, they didn't see any, any uh, benefit, personal benefit for them. No, it was really a direct political decision by the people like, we do not want you, you are destroyed, you failed us. And that's true. I mean, uh, even I, I, I said that publicly on, on Twitter, if, if it cost my seat, I will vote for dissolvement of the parliament because 600 uh, people, uh, peaceful demonstrators, uh, uh, the journalists were killed by these militias because government is weak. Prime Minister was weak to take uh, to stop them, and uh, there are more blood uh, every day. Uh, people are killed and kidnapped and tortured by these militias, and they are gaining more power as state become weaker and weaker. Uh, so that's uh, it's, it's a very dangerous uh, development if we are not really taking some serious steps uh, to, even if it's not 
early election, maybe in six months, at least in next year, to do something about that. And if the prime minister, which is the deadline is on Monday, <coughs> if he fails to uh, form the cabinet, I think the, 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 uh, the uh, early election will be the only way. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I should point out, for those who follow Iraq, there are a lot of commentators who are under the misimpression because they can't, they don't understand the significance of commas in legal drafting, um, are under the misimpression that the Iraqi president can dissolve parliament. He cannot. It is not within his uh, discretion. Uh, the parliament can only be dissolved by a simple majority of parliament itself. It's one of the deep flaws exactly. in, the, in the Iraqi constitution, which is to say the same parties that have caused the impasse have to be the ones willing to vote themselves out of office right. to get past the impasse. It's a, it's, a, it's a deep flaw in the Iraqi constitution. I should like to say, because I do wear the flag of the monarchy in my lapel, that uh, in <laughs> fact, the, in fact uh, the, uh, uh, there is a precedent for demonstrators forcing a government in Iraq to resign, and that's in 1948. Uh, the uh, Portsmouth Agreement demonstrations in which there were also um, demonstrators killed uh, by security forces caused the uh, government of uh, Saleh Jabr to resign, um, the first Shia Prime Minister of Iraq, uh, and Nouri Saeed, the longtime strongman of Iraq, was foreign minister. He also had to resign. Uh, Sayyid Muhammad al-Sadr was the president of the Senate. He was so outraged that uh, there were demon peaceful demonstrators killed. He resigned his seat in the Senate, and the Prince Regent called upon him to form a government and get us into elections. So it has happened before, um, but it's been a long time ago. Uh, let me open it up for, uh, for questions. Uh, Mr. Shaban, you, you have your hand up, I think. Yeah, uh, I, I thank you for coming. And I see the background you came from and what you are trying to do. And the title, Democracy in Iraq, should be changed to Chaos in Iraq. Because democracy actually, is for chaos. Because actually, we haven't had democracy. We haven't had democracy since 48, uh, 58, when the change from monarchy and so on. I, I didn't plant that question, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't talked about this. Well, you want information? I was in that demonstration. And I, I know that, as a matter of fact. So you, you've, you've come around to my way of thinking. Uh, no, that's a real thing. So we look at the corruption going on. Right. And if the parliament doesn't want to move because all of them are beneficiaries, uh, billions of Iraqi wealth is scattered. And, and the country is totally corrupt, much worse than what used during the royal regime, That's which true. was poor. And, and so what is the solution? Uh, if the parliament doesn't change, how, how long? You have already over 300 uh, killed uh, and, uh, and 1,500 you know, wounded. No, no, no. It's something like six, seven hundred killed right. and twenty two thousand wounded. Yes. Those are the official numbers. Right. Sorry, go ahead. You have yes. the question. What's the solution? Uh, well, it's 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 a it's a difficult to uh, give a solution just uh, right away. Uh, I I may have a solution, but it is not practical. Um, so send all of the elite after two thousand three to prison. So, but that's not going to work. Uh, so. Uh, uh, that's true. Iraq is uh, struggling from uh, corruption, massive corruption. It's the biggest cor biggest threat to Iraq is corruption now. Uh, and also after the corruption is the regional conflict between U.S. and Iraq. Uh, that's really also, if you live in Iraq, you know how uh, hard it is to live uh, one day. Maybe the President of the United States will have a tweet to sanction Iraq for uh, being friendly with Iraq. And that's, uh, uh, but because I mentioned that, because the institutions are very weak and they have been there only 17 years. Uh, and the U.S. left uh, at least members of these militias and they burned part of the U.S. Embassy. And they, it was really uh, sad to see the New York Times was covering, now the administrators are taking on the U.S. They are not the same people. They are in a different, uh, they have different flag, different demands a different location. The demonstrations in the street, there were some of them celebrating the killing of an Iranian general, which I didn't agree, like killing him in Iraq. Uh, I didn't agree that he intervened in Iraq and he should have been stopped. 
uh, but killing him in Iraq would make Iraqi-U.S. relations uh, at the brink of collapse. Well, another factor which is very new now is affecting the demonstrations to uh, get less attention and also to not to get together uh, in dense you know, population is uh, the coronavirus. Is now the Iraqi government, there, uh, they announced that there are some cases in Iraq, in Kirkuk, in Najaf, in other places. Uh, we had some cases, so they are in discouraging people to go to the cafes. Now the whole cafes and the uh, hookah places, I don't know if you're familiar with this, like the hookah, the shisha we call it. Uh, it's now, yeah, so it's, it's now like closed. So uh, if you are in Baghdad, uh, so you should, the, yesterday there was, in Soleimani, in my city also closed, there was a, a, a crowd in front of one of the uh, tobacco shops that people were trying to buy it and use it at home. <laughs> so that's also the coronavirus was another factor, just surprisingly uh, 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 became another factor to affect the demonstration. But they are still there. Uh, they are still uh, effective and the politicians, uh, to be honest, they are really scared of them and also scared of, the, uh, of Najaf's pressure as well. So they are still there, but maybe not as uh, covered as uh, uh, before. But also they see that they, some of them, they want to see, uh, give the uh, new government an opportunity if it is formed. Uh, let me go to Professor Choksi, then I'll come to Mr. Shepard. But let me start with Professor Choksi. Yes, uh, let me bring you back to the first question in from the audience. Yes. That is, how does one break the constitutional gridlock and move the electoral process forward. And the second part right to that would be uh, maybe in conjunction or thereafter, how does one defend the militias? And how to dissolve them or define them? Define, yeah. Take away their, <laughs> oh, okay. their teeth yeah. out. Oh, okay. Maybe okay. dissolving also if yeah. possible. Yeah, okay. Well, um, the, for, for the electoral system, it's, uh, it's uh, flexible because it's not part of the constitutional arrangement. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, constitution is just uh, says the, the election is for every four years, uh, four calendar years. So uh, the, it's not fixed in the constitution, it's in the law. So we amend it. We change the, the new electoral system gives uh, more opportunity for independent candidates, for candidates themselves, not for the political parties. Uh, a say in the because what what's going to happen in the past is like one candidate, the leader of the political party, will get like one million votes, and he will use that one million vote for other people. Maybe they had only like two hundred, three hundred votes. Like he will like distribute his votes to them. That's not going to happen anymore. So you are a popular candidate. You get your vote. The uh, that second person maybe it's a, from the different political party will be the second uh, uh, in the row. So it's not going to be a political party's list, it's more how popular a candidate is. Can I interrupt and yes. ask an internal question, yes. what we call the law of voir dire. Uh, how do you ensure the constitution requires 25% women in parliament? How do you, how do so you that's, ensure that's that? So that's, a, that's, a, that's a, the, the, one of the issues, that's why the bill is not completely passed. Uh, the, the, one of the issues is the, the, the uh, dividing the districts. How do you how do you divide the districts? Because some of the districts are disputed areas, and some mm -hmm. like big sit. So sectarian uh, issues is coming to this again, uh, or being try to make it to bring it back. Uh, also, the women uh, uh, quota, which is twenty five percent, should be moved for uh, the dedicated for women. Is that, for example? Uh, Soleimani, for example, we have 18 seats. That's how it's g g according to the population. So the out of the 18 seats, and you divide the districts. Uh, for example, in four, uh, you have to, we should have at least four women winning in Soleimani in order to go to the federal parliament. Uh, four women that they get the most votes, even if the the men are, you know, getting. Uh, five uh, or fifty thousand votes, but if there's a woman that getting like maybe twenty or ten thousand votes, so that's going to be it's going to be a stronger woman will go there, more popular woman, not only like the one that no, nobody knows them, they have no say they, because their party is popular and so they get the votes. So uh, it, it will be a better opportunity for independent women. 
to get that that, that chance. And now about the getting rid of the yes, militias. Yes, getting rid the of the militias. The power of the militias. Uh, what we did last uh, uh, last year, uh, it was an attempt by the prime minister to dissolve them or to integrate them uh, within the Iraqi uh, uh, security system. And some of them they they did. Some of them came under the the command of the Iraqi, not completely, but. Uh, they uh, they somehow controlled financially tied to the Iraqi government and th that's why also politically they were not able to move without the prime minister's uh, c uh, c command or without his uh, decision. But some of them, they are not real. They are Iraqi citizens, but they are not uh, part of the Iraqi you know, government or they don't want to be part of the Iraqi uh, uh, community. They are working on bigger... Uh, regional uh, uh, strategic uh, things for Iran. They're basically tied to Iran. Now, publicly, they say that. They say we are connected to the Supreme Leader of Iran. And that's the, 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 that's, that was my answer at the Atlantic Council uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the same question is, uh, we need those who want to be under the Iraqi government, we need to integrate them and we need to give them some you know, benefits, financial benefits to integrate them and they are people ready to do that, but also some of them they have ideological uh, background. It's not for Iraq, they, are, they don't consider themselves as Iraqis, they consider themselves as the soldiers of the Supreme Leader of Iran. That's, uh, uh, that's what they say. I mean, it's not, it's not an accusation. I'm not accusing any of them. That's what they say. That's what they called me when there was the pressure as to, uh, uh, to go to the parliament to vote against the presence of the U.S. forces in Iraq. To you know, force U.S. forces in Iraq out. And they were telling us, so we are the soldier of supreme leader. So that's, that's their thing. But the, 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 the courage or the, the, the next step is you need to be the prime minister of Iraq, need to have the courage to go to the supreme leader of Iran, telling them that keeping these guys in Iraq is, will destroy Iraq and will bring Americans' prisons even stronger. And will be, uh, you will, like, you know, the people in the South, I don't want to use the sectarian names, but that's the reality. The prime minister position is the strongest position in Iraq. It is, uh, is an executive stronger position. Goes to the people in the South, which they are uh, predominantly uh, Shia. And Iran is Shia, so they have some ties, stronger ties compared to the rest of the country. If they continue to be there, that will really have, uh, will cause the Shia domination, especially the Islamist Shia domination in Iraq. Uh, if they continue to be exploited by Iran against the U.S. inside Iraq. They can do whatever they want in Syria. They can do whatever they want in Yemen. That's not our problem in Iraq. We cannot control them. But we, can, we should be able to control them in Iraq. That's our problem, and we should not allow them to attack American uh, soldiers or any other interest, not only Americans, Europeans. Because if we have a problem with Americans, we can deal with Americans diplomatically, not... Uh, in the way that they, they do it. So because Iran does not do anything in, on its own soil, does not use any militias it, to, against anybody, why should we allow them to do it in our uh, country? And I, I think that's going to be one of the, uh, the, the task of the next prime minister to do that. It's, it's very hard, but it, it, somebody should to stand up for that. Mr. Shepard, very quickly. Uh, well, Actually, not very quickly, we have time. But, <laughs> but a question is my point. Oh, well, thank you for, for your talk. Um, and so going off of um, what we were saying about Iran's role in uh, interfering in Iraq and militias in Iraq oil the Supreme Leader, uh, I was hoping you could talk about the role of Grab Adhullah Ali Sistani and you know, his influence over the Iraqi government and his influence in uh, encountering uh, Iraqi militias or what Sistani's relationship to uh, the, the Iraqi government and, and Iran or his role in the Iraqi political process in general. Uh, right, Grand Ayatollah Sistani has been playing a very important role in uh, in Iraq uh, in framing the Iraqi political system since the uh, that 2003, and it was tricky that it was him forcing President Bush to hold elections and also to put the constitution uh, for vote. President Bush didn't want to uh, people to vote for the constitution, only maybe uh, kind of a de delegates to vote like a parliament, not a popular vote. So uh, a, a religious uh, uh, clerk was forcing a democratic uh, president to do a democratic thing. So that was somehow uh, controversial. But 
he had he played an important role in uh, uh, somehow countering Iranian uh, influence in Iraq, but that's more of a historical uh, uh, somehow competition between Qum and Najaf. The the, the religious city uh, professor will be uh, more best position to talk about that. Oh, he uh, is. He's writing a dissertation <laughs> okay. on that topic. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so the, it is. He had played also uh, supporting the demonstrators, uh, Grand Atul Sistani. But for me, as a person, I am pro for a secular Iraqi state, uh, which he is not claiming. He's not really uh, fighting for a religious state. He's not fighting for having Wilayat Faqiyah of the Supreme Leader of Iran doing the, the, having a, another Supreme Leader in Iraq. Uh, so that's we are grateful for that. Uh, but also, the, 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 the intervention of Americans in Iraq against Iran make his position weak make him to get to be seen as somebody who's not standing up for for example for for interventions in Iraq for Americans and because that was one of the his demands that the, the, the militias need to be dissolved they need to be uh, part of the uh, Iraqi government or integrated in the Iraqi political system I think with him and also a, a, a strong uh, prime minister we can uh, f uh, force the Iranian at least to uh, uh, remove these militias from Iraqi soil, just take them somewhere else. Uh, without him, I think it will be difficult for, for example, for the president of Iraq to do it. And he's not in that position to do it. And also the, for the for, for Iraqi speaker of parliament also uh, will be difficult. I think he will be best positioned and also with the prime minister to uh, do that. And they have some uh, differences with Iranians. People, they think they are all Shia in Iraq. They are, you know, sympathetic with the Iranian political system, but that's not true. We have a small, the Shia, the militias we are talking about in South, really maybe not less than 20% of the overall militias, which they are under the control of the Iraqi government. Yes, sir. Uh, Carl? Let's go in the back. We'll come back to you if there are no other questions. But uh, Thank you uh, for coming. We appreciate uh, your presence. Um, the fact that you, who are critical both of um, uh, Kurdistan regional government as well as the central government, uh, were elected, and the fact that um, you uh, stand with a new party suggests that perhaps there's um, more to Iraq democracy than some people give the country credit for. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the formation of your party and the extent, uh, the national extent of your party, and um, how you campaigned and were elected. Uh, it was an interesting uh, uh, development uh, happening. Uh, in 2017, when uh, ISIS was, uh, uh, 2000, I think it was the beginning of 2017, ISIS was defeated. And then when ISIS was defeated, uh, Kurdish Peshmerga uh, with the rest of, of uh, Iraqi security forces, they played a strong uh, role in defeating ISIS, but also uh, internationally they were promoted uh, in the media that for doing the fight uh, against uh, ISIS. So that made the Kurdish leaders in Iraq to think about something else uh, uh, and independence. So they what they did is they uh, uh, back then President Barzani, um, uh, who, who was the uh, president of uh, Kurdistan region, Masoud Barzani, he uh, declared that he will hold a, a referendum uh, to ask the people of Kurdistan region whether they want to be part of Iraq or they want to have a state. I think that was the that's a, the, the the something that you, you don't need a question. I mean that, that's the majority. The, the dream of majority of the Kurds to have a state in, in general. But to be rational, we 2005 uh, uh, peacefully, without anybody forcing us, with the rest of Iraq, decided to again be part of Iraq when Iraq was overthrown. We wrote the constitution together. And by the way, Arabic language is not the only official language of Iraq. Both Kurdish and Arabic are official languages of Iraq. And that's not happening in Turkey, which is they have 20 million of Kurds. That's not happening in Iran, uh, which they have like 10 millions of Kurds. In Syria, they are denying their existence as, uh, at all. So in Iraq, we have the best position, the best position. And also the president of Iraq usually, by norms, 
will be somebody, a Kurdish person, will be the president of Iraq, and which he will represent Iraq internationally. It's a K Kurdish person. So, and also, we go beyond that. We do not consider, maybe some people will be hurt by that, uh, consider Iraq as an Arab state. We call it as an Iraqi state. It's, uh, there are you know, Arabs, majority Arab, but also there are Kurds, Assyrian, Kildo Assyrian, other minority groups with the Turkmen's. They do not consider themselves as Arabs. So that's why uh, Arab identity mm -hmm. is not a collective identity for all Iraqis. So we can even have our own security. We have our, the Iraqi army is not allowed in Kurdistan without the permission of the Kurdistan parliament. Uh, it's all, everything is done, even if we go beyond that. We have some foreign relation, which is somehow a violation of the Iraqi constitution, uh, separate from the Iraqi. It is a violation, uh, but they, they do it. That's Iraq is like kind of a, okay with that. It's like a status quo. Okay, our, the Kurdistan regional government was recognized by the constitution, was not established by the constitution. It was there, but there was an international decision in 1991 when the, uh, Saddam tried to attack in when there was an uprising, tried to attack Kurdistan region, take over again, uh, and there was a threat of using again chemical weapon against the people. People left, like two million people left to Iran, to Iranian border. So uh, everything is is recognized. We get the our financial sh share. Even we have our own oil. We do not share with the rest of Iraq. We sell it, uh, and there are some disagreements. Our main problem in in Iraq, for example. Uh, is not a cultural or ethnic issues. We have financial issues, like mm -hmm. California, maybe uh, Indiana, you have financial uh, disagreements with Washington, right? It's, it's a financial disagreement, it's not ethnic issues. Uh, we have some sensitive areas, like disputed areas, whether they should be part of KRG, or they should be part of Kurdistan regional government, or they should be part of Baghdad. That's also like, that's fine. That's still like, it's not, uh, there are people not being prosecuted because they are Kurdish in Baghdad. Completely uh, uh, f uh, removed all of the animosity toward the Kurdish ethnicity in Iran. So we have a peaceful coexistence now, constitutional uh, arrangement. And that was the idea when Barzani uh, announced that he will uh, unilaterally uh, ask people for uh, whether they want to be part of Iraq or not without a peaceful deal with Baghdad, and we, as a group of young people, were crazy enough to be to op oppose him. Like it was very risky. It was, you know, risky by like where they were threatening us. If they have a Kurdish state, they will call us traitors and they will expel us from the country. And I'm I'm, I'm Kurdish and from a city. Ninety nine percent of the city is Kurdish from Suleimani. Uh, and Arabic even was not my <coughs> second language. English is my second language. Arabic I learned through working at the U.S. Embassy, which is somehow uh, funny to learn at the U.S. Embassy Arabic, but in Baghdad. Uh, learning to speak, actually. Uh, I studied Arabic, but didn't learn to speak. Uh, so that was the moment when we stood up to him. We said, no, that's dangerous, unilateral action, against this Baghdad is going to be economically, security-wise, will be, will backfire. And you should not do that. We launched a, a, a new movement called No for, uh, uh, for Independence. And it was dangerous. And uh, it was very risky because that was the, the, uh, the, the dream of the Kurdish people, to have a state. And Barzani hold, held a referendum in 2017, uh, in September 2017, and it failed. Uh, it failed, it backfired of the territories he controlled, and Baghdad sanctioned Kurdistan for a while. Uh, Kurdistan International Airports were, became national airports when international air, uh, uh, flights were not allowed for a couple of months. And then <coughs> financially, well, like, Kurdistan was constrained, Iran somehow closed the border, Turkey put in pressure, and we are in a la landlocked, by the way, Kurdistan is a landlocked area. And then that we lost what we had. And he didn't have any alternative. Even Americans, the then U.S. Secretary uh, Tillerson, called him not to do it. He said, we will have better negotiation with Baghdad for other disagreements you have, but don't do it. It's going to be, uh, when, you, when you do it, and you will be responsible for, for what's happening after that. And, uh, and then he was forced out. He was forced to resign when he failed. Uh, then that was the moment that we found this is an opportunity for us 
to uh, challenge the uh, Kurdish nationalist separatist uh, movement and to completely enter the politics to be uh, uh, campaigning for pro battle And people were seeing more legitimacy for what we said than, than what Bazani said. It was total rhetoric, what he said. And that was the moment we went to Baghdad. We had, uh, uh, which was based on provinces, least in, in Baghdad, all of the old candidates, people from Baghdad. I think there was only one Kurdish Faili, which is from Baghdad, the Faili Kurds, and they live in Baghdad. All of them from the different sect. We had a list in Baghdad. We didn't win because of the massive uh, fraud. In Kirkuk, head of our list was a Turkmen person. Uh, in uh, uh, Mosul, it was also a Shia Turkmen person, uh, somebody, a young guy. We didn't win in those cities. We run on the national level, and we use social media instead of uh, uh, you know traditional media, and that was effective because we were targeting the young people in Kurdistan, also in the rest of Iraq. That we have to work together, not fighting against each other. We have the best opportunity to peacefully live together in, 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 in Iraq. I know that's a dream of every Kurd to have a state, but if we have a, a, a better deal with Baghdad, why would we want to have a, a unilateral, uh, take unilateral actions and will, will, will not be uh, sustainable? And that was the moment when we started doing that. Now we are trying to, for this election, uh, because it's based on popular candidate, not a list or a political party, to see who is interested in those cities, basically running on national level. I have to fight in, 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 in the Iraqi parliament on both voices. We have people, racist in the south, that blame everything on Kurdistan regions, of course, if there are corruption in Kurdistan, for what's happening in Baghdad, which is not true. And also, we have racist Kurds also, they are blaming Baghdad for whatever is happening in Kurdistan. So I have to fight both sides. So both sides are like bad guys. So I hope that we have now, we have some more people, like um, more rational people, that believe in this kind of uh, ethnic division is the tactic used by elite. It is not real. It was not a real concern or uh, issue of the Iraqi, and that was not why we are here now. It's not because of the... Uh, of the Kurds or Nagod or the Shia or Sunnis. It's just because the elite themselves, among all of the uh, groups, they failed us. They were the responsible for corruption. That was a very long answer, but I had to you know, go back to the little bit of history of that. Can I ask you how many seats you have uh, in parliament as, four. as a new generation? Uh, four four and seats. And where are they from? Uh, two from Suleimania, two from Erbil. Two from Suleimania, two from Erbil. Now, this is an important point because the current president of Iraq, who is also from Suleimania, Suleimania right. did not win a single seat, I think, from Suleimania. Only one. Uh, from one from Erbil. One, one from Erbil, one but, from Suli. Oh, I thought he didn't get any from yeah, Suleimania. Get, so one. in any event, they have twice the number of seats as the sitting president of Iraq, right. for reference. Right. Any other questions? Now, we're supposed to have a 25% uh, constitutional set aside for women. Uh, I haven't seen a, a woman's hand go up, so right. uh, are there questions from that sector? I don't see any other questions, so if you have a second question, so go ahead. Thank you. What's your assessment of the, uh, the uh, status of the Iraqi security apparatus, army, other uh, branches of, of, of the security establishment? Because if you are hoping that the prime minister to stand up uh, to Iran, if you are hoping for uh, a system uh, to play a role in forcing Iran or persuading Iran to disband its militias in Iraq, do these? Uh, does the prime minister have uh, have, have have support? Does does uh, can he rely on his security forces to back him in case of a? Of a of a, an Iranian refusal to, 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 to back down or to... to we have two groups of people in the, uh, from the south of Iraq that some of them they are uh, seen as pro-Iranian, some of them are seen as not anti-Iranian but pro-Iraq, so they do not want direct Iranian interventions. For example, <laughs> before the killing of Qasem Soleimani, Muqtad al-Assad was the one who blocked a pro-Iranian uh, minister of interior. He didn't allow Farah uh, Fayyad, he, he, he stopped the nomina his nomination and failed his nomination for the Minister of Interior because he, see, he see, saw him as too close to Iran 
and cannot be controlled. So he didn't allow that happen. And that was somehow growing more pro-Iraqi among even the militias, uh, pro-Iraqi sentiment than uh, until the killing of, of, of Soleimani, which destructed that, that sentiment. Uh, I, I can, we cannot rely 100% on, on religious person to do what we want to do uh, if we want to have a circular state. But that, uh, like some steps can be taken by them, not by us, because that was, we will be seen as enemies, but they are like somehow uh, can talk to each other. This prime minister, whoever is, is, is whether Alawi or somebody else, cannot do everything. Uh, because he, he will be seen as an independent and somebody who doesn't have political backing in the parliament. Uh, and that's make him weak. Now it's a demand for people to have independent person in, the, in, the, in the, that position. But I think that independency in this case, he doesn't have a like, strong political support in the parliament will make him weaker uh, to deal with, uh, with uh, rival groups inside the parliament. But uh, we have to wait for the next election, whether it's early election or the next election, 2022, uh, to have uh, new uh, groups to come up, uh, have somebody to take the lead. But this prime minister, I'm not, I don't have a hope for him to be that strong, but just starting the process because it's, it's too dangerous, it's too delicate to keep them uh, and keep, uh, keep shooting or uh, fighting uh, U.S. In, in Iraq which is against the Iraqi interest. And we do not want a U.S. forever to stay in Iraq, but we want to them to stay as long as uh, we can have. Now we have a stronger intelligence community. Now I think we, uh, most of the, pe uh, the, the people, they can somehow appreciate the leadership of the intelligence community now in Iraq. Uh, uh, so, uh, but other sectors, we went through the fight against ISIS, we went through, through the reformations, having more units, counter-terrorism units. So that the security sector and military, they need a, 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 a restructuring and reforms. But when you have people on street asking for, for food and for jobs and other uh, basic services, I think the reforming of security sector somehow make it less priority for prime minister or even the parliament. But that's, that's the, the, that should be the long-term goal because we do not have the problem of weapons we have good you know getting some good weapons from the u.s and also not the human uh, resources uh, but we do not have the structure for that that can work for iraq and can be controlled by the iraqi prime minister not by uh, groups militias uh, reporting to different countries yes ma'am correct me if i'm wrong uh, you know, what i'm I, what i feel like i'm hearing from you is that the the worst thing the United States can do is to uh, distract uh, Iraq by through geopolitical maneuvering, uh, and that the the killing of Qasem Soleimani, you know, we, we worry about. Oh my God, are we going to go go to war with with uh, Iran? And of course, the worry, well, what does this do to Iraq? And it didn't even occur to me that this is just a gigantic distraction for for you in the midst of very important reform work. But so, what ad advice would you give to the United States uh, government? I mean, it's a whole of government, not right. just uh, in, you know forgetting who's president and right. who might be Secretary of State. <laughs> It sounds like you can use us as a cudgel against Iran under certain circumstances if we behave. Right. Uh, but what can we do for you uh, that will help Iraq grow stronger and more democratic and more stabilized? Uh, well, the, 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 the conflict with Iran uh, on the Iraqi soil did distract uh, us from doing what we have to do and distracted even the protesters a couple of times and made parliament not to be able to hold sessions for a month because we were afraid that uh, uh, there will be a demand for forcing or collapsing, ending the relation with the United States. And it will be uh, very destructive. And that was the popular demand from, uh, like I said, we have dozens of MPs that were detained, tortured, or arrested by Americans. They are anti-Americans. 
and there are militia leaders who were hurt, their friends, their, their people who were killed by U.S. strikes. I know they are also harassing U.S. and they killed an Iraqi, U.S. Iraqi citizen in Kirkuk. But that's, uh, that's make, his, make our opposition, especially for this parliament, is uh, weaker. What we want from Washington, whatever they have, the problems we have, differences with Iran, I do not want them like to stay silent, no. What we want is they have to force the Iraqi leaders to take a stand, so otherwise there will not be, for example, financial economic benefits they get from the United States. The World Bank, the IMF, whatever others, we, have, we are take, getting millions of dollars uh, from the U.S. for military aid, for uh, IDP, refugee programs. We're not getting a penny from Iran or any other country. Uh, uh, Iran is benefiting from the Iraqi trade and uh, other things. But that they have to use this to force the Iraqis to do this, not themselves do it, like disrespecting Iraq, making them weak, making them irrelevant, making them like a, they are a colonial of the U.S. Uh, and not having, not trusting them. Uh, so the prime minister was like there for almost two years. He was not invited to the White House. He was not trusted by the, by the, by the White House. He was not seen as their guy. So that he was in, uh, somehow independent. He was not pro-Iran, like somebody. He was sympathetic, maybe, with some of the things with Iran. But he wanted to do something for Iraq, but he was not given, I, I thought he was not given the opportunity by the White House to, uh, uh, especially for the problems he was facing, not with Iran internally, like the economic reforms, other things he was facing. So he was uh, uh, somehow uh, be the tax sacrifice of the Iranian and also uh, U.S. conflict. So that's what we do not want to happen uh, again. We do not want U.S. to do things in Iraq independent or unilaterally. If they have a problem, if there's a threat, direct threat, I think they have the, the, the leverage to force Iraqi uh, politicians, uh, maybe n not publicly, uh, to, f to do things, take stands against uh, uh, Iran. And some people may not believe that. But it was the prime minister of, of, of uh, Hyderabadi who a couple times uh, disrupted Iranian contracts in the South when they were not really doing their jobs. It was because he had the support of the United States. Uh, and also he, he threatened Iranian in private that he will go to Saudi Arabia and Kuwait to get the, to buy the energy. Now we are $2 billion, I think, uh, worth of uh, buying energy from Iran, uh, electricity and also energy, gas, natural gas. Uh, we have them, but we have not invested in them. Uh, that's why we buy from Iran. So somehow made Iran to back up, like just to step away, to step back from like putting pressure too much on him. Nuri al-Maliki, when Iran during Obama administration was under pressure, uh, uh, sanctioned for oil sector, it was Nuri al-Maliki who promised the American and which who did 700,000 more oil uh, to be uh, added to the Iraqi uh, export, uh, oil export. So uh, Saudi Arabia didn't do that. Uh, that was, uh, I mentioned this because that was, I was in a private meeting with American officials and with the Kurdish officials. Uh, they meant, they told the Kurdish officials, you are our friend, you consider like yourself as our ally, but it is Nuri Maliki who is doing uh, better than you for us now, because back then the oil was like 100, uh, dollars for per barrel, and that the market was not stable, and Iran had to be sanctioned, and that was also affected. So Iraq almost one million uh, barrel added to its uh, exportation, and that affected the market stability. Saudi Arabia was not ready to do that quickly. Uh, so, and also there are some other steps which is sensitive. Maybe not. Do not want to mention. Maliki did some. They took some stance. He. It was Maliki who disarmed the Shia militias of Sadr and with Americans, fight, fought against them, defeated them, disarmed them uh, in the South uh, because he had the strong support of President Bush and Americans. Uh, and I think it, it will be uh, important to, to be seen like that. When you have a prime minister in Iraq is not supported by Washington, who's going to take that guy? Iran is ready to, to welcome him uh, to be his friend. Yes. Media, right. which is popular among young people. Right. Uh, so, is there an op 
opportunity that to uh, influence uh, young people or politically active to, uh, to, to people to reach out and to mobilize them uh, to create maybe political party which will be for uh, for for um, like for national interests without right. waiting uh, big powers to come in and help. Is there a hope that uh, young people will come together and save the country and not waiting for U.S. or for big center powers? Well, that may, that, that's, that's for, for elections, for campaigning. I think people will find a uh, way to do it by themselves. And they don't need uh, the huge support from outside the uh, world, uh, except like maybe some training workshops, which the, there are some NDI, other U.S. organizations are helping candidates and uh, uh, even MPs when they are elected uh, for human capacity building. But what we need from the US is more um, in helping the institutions to be stronger and also helping us to reach a level that we can do it by ourselves, like preventing the interventions of our neighbors. Uh, because they are powerful, they are strong, they can do it, they can exploit our uh, uh, democratic system. So uh, through the elections or even you have struggle here uh, Russia is intervening, so how can we pre prevent that? But uh, you mentioned about the independent media. We used to have independent media, but it, not anymore. There are some privately owned media institutions, but really they have political agenda. There are there is no like huge me independent media institution. There's state media, but not independent. It's a state media. It's not effective, not popular. In Arabic in Kurdish, they have it. Al Iraqiya called. Uh, in Kurdistan, we do not have even that. By the, by the government, funded by the government. And also, we don't have this culture that people can contribute or donate. And we don't have a banking system, and also we don't have the culture. Uh, people, they, they expect politicians to give them money, not to give money to the politicians. I get a lot of phone calls for, for that, that they expect, like I'm, I'm a, a millionaire. So uh, it's, that, that's the, it's, it's difficult to, uh, it's even weird to ask people to contribute to campaign, uh, or they think everybody, everybody when it's a politician, they have money somewhere. So when I'm explaining to them, I do not have it because I do not want to uh, accept uh, the bribes. I do not want to do something for companies in exchange of, you know, votes or something, or pu pushing a, uh, a bill for them. So that's how you make money. When you have an MP rich, he got or she got money somewhere else. It's not because of the salary. The salary is good to have a good life. Uh, I'm not saying like we are poor, we get a good salary, it's good for, for Iraqi politicians, they can use it for activities they, they want to have, but it, that doesn't make them rich. When you have a politician is rich, something wrong is going on. Uh, with that. But by the way, I, I, I forgot to mention something. Uh, we mentioned that new generation party that we formed, but now we have a, a new block we want to have uh, include not only other parts of Iraq, but also there are division among the Kurdish political parties uh, outside of the PUK and KDP, uh, change movement and others. So many people disenfranchised from the political parties. We have a new group uh, called the Future, so hopefully it will be the future for Iraq. And we're attracting new people for uh, uh, political parties in Iraq, uh, the names. Like you don't, ha you don't have a brand except in Kurdistan for a political party name. It's a very bad idea to That's use the same fun. name. <laughs> so it's uh, people and uh, they change different names. They all, uh, for example, that were party. They never run on mm -hmm. the, the platform of that were party. Always something else. And they include other groups, independent people. But the dominant group will be the Dawa party, for example, the state of law. Uh, so we have some idea to include other people and also have a national agenda, but also uh, giving the people of Baghdad and Basra having. Uh, s their strategy to serve the people of Basra, also having the people of Suleimania to serve the people of Suleimania, but nationally they can cooperate and they can fight uh, uh, against the, the big uh, parties. That's our hope and hopefully we will be successful. We are trying for that. On that optimistic note, please join me in thanking Mr. Shafiq. Thank